Hello, hello, I'm the Jim Stanham, and today it is story time. Now, if you haven't watched the first episode yet, the link to the playlist will be in the description, and I highly recommend you watch that first. For the rest of you, please have a seat and let old Jim tell you a story. The story of a red world. The year is 1955 and the Cold War has begun to coalesce. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, spurred on by the devastating loss in the Korean War, had begun to rapidly develop into a true military alliance, ostensibly neutral to the brewing ideological conflict, but with concrete plans to counter a communist invasion. As such, they sought to expand as far into Europe as they possibly could in order to contain communist aggression. In 1952, Turkey and Greece joined NATO, much to Soviet annoyance, as this move essentially encircled the Soviet Union and her allies. In order to counter this, the Soviets needed proof that NATO was nothing more than a front for America's influence in the West. In 1954, the Soviet Union asked to join NATO, even offering to sacrifice East Germany to do so, hoping that they could create a neutral and permanently disarm Germany in exchange for NATO being confirmed as a neutral defensive alliance. Unsurprisingly, NATO rejected Soviet admittance into the organization, confirming to the world that NATO was, at its core, an anti-communist organization in the pocket of the US. On May 9th, 1955, West Germany joined the organization, granting them the authority to rearm with the blessing of the US. This was a grave insult to the Soviet Union, and with First Secretary Georgi Malenkov having only just made his position secure after a years-long power struggle, he knew he had to act. Less than a week later, on May 14th, the communist nations of Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Bulgaria, Romania, Albania, and East Germany joined the Soviet Union in creating the Warsaw Pact, a military and economic alliance that hoped to counter Western imperialism. President Eisenhower, a former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, was troubled by this turn of events, but a year later, NATO would face its first major crisis. On July 26, 1956, after failed negotiations with the Western powers, Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal, kicking the British and the French out and forbidding Israeli access through the canal. For America, this was certainly not an ideal situation, but Eisenhower wanted to keep Egypt from falling under Soviet influence, so he was prepared to declare it as fait accompli for the sake of long-term peace in the Middle East. For Britain and France, though, the Suez Canal was a vital piece of their empires, already weakened by the burgeoning decolonial movement in the preceding decades. Offended by America's lax attitude towards the theft of their colonial possessions, British Prime Minister Anthony Eden and French Prime Minister Guy Mollet plotted to act independently of the United States and take action. Behind closed doors, the British and French joined with the Israelis and formulated their plan. Israel would invade Egypt on the grounds of reopening Israeli access to the Straits of Tehran and the Suez Canal. After the Israelis invaded the Sinai Peninsula, Britain and France would intervene to separate the combatants and protect the canal. And then after Egypt was defeated, Britain and France would keep the canal indefinitely. On October 29th, the plan was set in motion, as Israeli forces slammed into Egyptian lines. On November 1st, the British and French launched Operation Musketeer, bombing the Sinai Peninsula and landing troops on Port Said. By November 5th, the Israelis had near total control of the Sinai Peninsula, and the British and French were on the cusp of securing full control of the canal. By all accounts, both operations were a massive tactical success, but this success was not to last. The United States almost immediately deduced that this invasion was a joint Franco-British-Israeli effort, and Eisenhower was furious. Eisenhower wanted to court Egypt as a counterbalance against Soviet influence in the Middle East, and now Britain and France sought to undermine America's foreign policy just to protect their dying empires. Just as in the Korean War, America drafted a resolution in the United Nations demanding a ceasefire, but just as in the Korean War, the resolution was vetoed. Not by the Soviet Union this time, but by America's own allies. Signifying the oddity of the situation, the Soviets drafted their own resolution in agreement with America on a ceasefire in Egypt, which too was vetoed by Britain and France. This division over the Suez Crisis threatened to tear NATO apart, 
with West German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer condemning America for seemingly siding with the Soviet Union over their allies in Europe. Some aides close to the president were even suggesting that, based on the tripartite agreement of 1950, the United States was obligated to declare war on Britain and France to restore the status quo in the Middle East, though that idea was unlikely to say the least. Still, the United States did everything in its power to dissuade Britain and France from continuing their course of action. Eisenhower issued an ultimatum to Eden, withdraw or America would crash Britain's economy by selling off their bonds of pound sterling. By this time for Eden, the crisis had already turned into a fiasco at home. Debates in Parliament had nearly devolved into fistfights, protests rocked the streets of every major city, and the outrage over the crisis had united the fractured opposition against him. If Eisenhower carried out his threat, Britain would be ruined. Finally facing the reality that the British Empire was on borrowed time, Eden relented and announced a ceasefire on November 6th, without warning the French or Israelis beforehand. Without Britain, France and Israel knew they couldn't maintain their offensive, so they too made peace with Egypt. All three parties agreed to withdraw, and the Suez Canal would remain under Nasser's control. This sparked the death knell for the British and French as world powers, leaving them firmly as junior partners to the United States. NATO survived the crisis, but there was now clear division and distrust between the United States on one side and Europe on the other, a division that would only grow over the next three decades. While NATO was facing its first crisis, the home front, mercifully, was relatively calm. The 1956 elections were rolling around, and Eisenhower had become controversial among the Republican base, as the formation of the Warsaw Pact caused concerns that his hardline stance against communism was failing to deliver tangible results. In addition, the conservatives in the party were concerned about Eisenhower's handling of the Suez Crisis, feeling that he should have sided with his allies instead of Egypt. Still the Republican establishment stuck with him, and Eisenhower won the nomination unopposed. The Democratic primary, on the other hand, was bitterly contested between 1952 nominee Adlai Stevenson and New York Governor William Averill Harriman. Though he couldn't secure John F. Kennedy's endorsement before his tragic passing, Harriman still managed to win the nomination in a stunning upset, running on a populist New Wave platform, promising radical social changes such as civil rights for African Americans. However, Harriman's past as a centrist establishment politician eroded his credibility in the eyes of the public. Once again, Eisenhower won the general election, losing some support among Republicans, but gaining massively among Democrats, especially white Southerners and Northern Catholics. Nobody knew it at the time, but trouble was on the horizon, as this would be the last presidential election where a candidate won outright until 1972. Eisenhower's second term saw rising unrest between the disenfranchised black community and the southern whites who supported Jim Crow laws. In 1954, the Supreme Court had issued a ruling, Brown v. Board of Education, that enforced the desegregation of public schools. However, the actual desegregation process was slowed by state and local governments, with Senator Harry Byrd encouraging a massive resistance policy against desegregation throughout the South. Eisenhower had already overseen the desegregation of the armed forces, and by 1957, Eisenhower had enough of the obstructive segregationists. He encouraged the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1957, the first civil rights legislation since 1875, and fought to desegregate public schools by any means necessary. On September 4th, Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus called up the Arkansas National Guard to prevent nine black students from registering for classes at Little Rock Central High School. For weeks afterwards, mobs were formed outside the school, and the whole city seemed to be on the verge of a race riot. Furious at this blatant disregard for federal law, and concerned for the safety of black citizens in Little Rock, Eisenhower invoked the Insurrection Act of 1807 and sent the 101st Airborne Division to protect the Little Rock Nine as they went to school. At the same time, Eisenhower issued an executive order federalizing the Arkansas National Guard, taking them out of Governor Faubus's control. Order was quickly restored in Little Rock, but the burgeoning civil rights movement would only grow over the next 10 years. Still, the situation at home remained calm, and Eisenhower could turn his eyes back towards foreign policy. And just in time, too, as 90 miles off the coast of Florida, Eisenhower's nightmare was about to become reality. Though Eisenhower had sent the CIA to uphold order for Cuban dictator Fulgencio Batista, 
the country was constantly on the verge of revolution, and by 1958, Congress had effectively stonewalled any further attempts to support the regime directly. In late 1958, rebels under the command of Che Guevara had seized the city of Santa Clara, and Batista understood that his reign was at an end. On New Year's Day, 1959, Batista fled the country with the untold riches he had accumulated during his time in office, and what remained of Batista's government was in disarray. On January 8th, the leader of the rebel 26th of July movement, Fidel Castro, marched into Havana and proclaimed the success of the revolution. Eisenhower was horrified. Though the 26th of July movement was not a strictly communist movement, many communists such as Che Guevara and Raul Castro were key figures in overthrowing the Batista regime, and Eisenhower was convinced that Fidel Castro would inevitably join them in proclaiming a communist government. Surprisingly, though Fidel had just overthrown a West-aligned government and was in league with communists, he was willing to reach out to America in the hopes of establishing friendly relations with the Eisenhower administration. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Eisenhower rejected these overtures, calling Castro a madman and preparing the CIA for yet another intervention. However, Eisenhower wouldn't have time to prepare such an intervention before his time in office was finished, so it was up to his successor to continue fighting communism at home and abroad. With the 22nd Amendment having been ratified in 1951, Eisenhower was the first president to be term-limited and thus ineligible to run for president again. In his place, the Republican Party rallied around Vice President Richard Nixon, a hardline anti-communist who promised to destroy Fidel Castro's government in Cuba and defend America from communist agitators. The Democratic Party, on the other hand, was bitterly divided between the liberals, tepidly supporting Texan Senator Lyndon B. Johnson, and the conservatives, led by Floridian Senator George Smathers. Without a charismatic unifying figure like John F. Kennedy, the Democratic Party tore itself apart as Smathers won by the slimmest of margins. Furious at this outcome, Johnson gathered his supporters and formed his own party, the Independent Democrats, to contest the presidential election. In the end, Richard Nixon won the most electoral votes at 247, just barely beating out Smathers who had 241 votes, and with Johnson in third with 49 votes. Since no candidate won the 269 electoral votes needed for a majority, this election would be decided by Congress, with the House of Representatives deciding the president and the Senate deciding the vice president. Fortunately for Nixon, the Republicans still held control of both houses of Congress, and in January, the House confirmed Nixon as president, while the Senate confirmed his running mate, Jim Rhodes, as vice president. Curiously, the Senate confirmed Rhodes first, thus making him a caretaker president for a brief period, a position he would find himself in again four years later. Now securely in power, Nixon sought to continue Eisenhower's crusade against communism, starting with Cuba. Though the idea of restoring Batista was a non-starter, there were several other Cuban dissidents who could fill the role, particularly General Huber Matos, a non-communist veteran of the 26th of July movement, who was disillusioned with the country's turn towards communism. Eisenhower had already started laying the groundwork, having his CIA informants guide Matos through the steps of plotting a coup. The Matos' original plan was to resign from the army and hope that public protests would convince Castro to schedule free elections, the CIA dissuaded him of the idea. Instead, he laid low, slowly gathering support from the largely non-communist Llanos of the 26th of July movement. Meanwhile, the CIA were using their contacts in Haiti to smuggle weapons into the country, planning an armed uprising to finally end the Castro regime and install a West-aligned government once again. On February 17, 1961, the coup was set in motion, and the results were nothing short of disastrous. In the early hours of that fateful day, Matos made his move. From his base in the province of Camagüe, Matos commanded the soldiers under him to rise in rebellion and march on Havana. In a speech broadcast all across Cuba, Matos called for the people to fight against the communist regime and restore democracy. Indeed, the people took to the streets, but not in the way he intended. Matos and the CIA had gravely underestimated Castro's popularity, and instead of rising in revolt, the people marched in solidarity with Castro, and loyalist forces quickly mobilized against Matos. The rebellion was crushed in less than a week, and Matos was arrested on February 20th. 
Following this naked display of aggression against the Cuban government, Castro dropped all pretense of neutrality and leapt into the Soviet sphere of influence, hoping First Secretary Malenkov would protect them from another coup, or worse, an American invasion. By every conceivable metric, Matos' coup was a disaster for the United States, but the situation in Cuba was about to get much, much worse. In the summer of 1961, Reconnaissance planes flying over Cuba made a horrifying discovery. Castro was building a number of missile launch facilities with Soviet aid. This could only mean one thing. The Soviet Union was plotting to house nuclear weapons on the island. Just as the United States had done to the Soviets with Turkey, the Soviet Union was going to use Cuba as a base to plant nuclear weapons dangerously close to American soil. A communist Cuba was already dangerous, but a communist Cuba with nuclear weapons would be an existential threat. Still, Nixon weighed his options. Nixon couldn't let Cuba have nuclear weapons under any circumstances, but if Cuba was invaded directly, the Soviet Union would no doubt see it as a declaration of war, and nobody wanted World War III. Nixon also didn't want to waste more resources on another CIA-backed coup, considering how poorly the last one went. Knowing that Nixon was running out of time, Secretary of State William Rogers approached him with an idea. Blockade Cuba and prevent them from receiving any nuclear warheads from the Soviets. Rogers argued that this would at least buy Nixon more time to formulate a strategy. Nixon agreed, and on July 24th, America instituted a full blockade of ships bound for Cuba, which First Secretary Malenkov denounced as an act of piracy. At a White House press conference that afternoon, Under Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, allegedly the mastermind behind the blockade, announced to the world that the United States would not permit any offensive weapons to be delivered to Cuba. Kissinger demanded that all missiles in Cuba be dismantled and returned to the Soviet Union. For 22 days, the United States and the Soviet Union were eyeball to eyeball on the brink of nuclear war, but in the end, the United States blinked first. Worried that Nixon might back down, Secretary Rogers had plotted to subvert the president's authority and use the CIA to launch his own coup in Cuba. However, news of the plot leaked, and Nixon could not allow this mutiny to happen right under his nose. Nixon fired Rogers, a dramatic move, right as the crisis had reached its peak. Notably, Kissinger was not fired, despite being allegedly the mastermind behind this scheme, too. Still, the world now knew that Nixon was no longer in control of his own cabinet, and the United States lost all leverage when it came to negotiating terms. In a spectacular display of capitulation, the United States agreed to withdraw all nuclear missiles from Turkey and Italy, while the Soviet Union was permitted to maintain half of its planned arsenal in Cuba. Such a stunning blow to America's position in the Cold War obliterated Nixon's credibility and the American public started to believe that Nixon was secretly a communist sympathizer. Nixon's image never fully recovered from this event, but this was not the end of his term, and he still had time to claw back from the brink and regain some public support, and hopefully preserve his legacy. In 1963, a wave of riots broke out in black communities, furious at police brutality and the Nixon administration's failure to enforce civil rights legislation. Here, Nixon saw an opportunity to restore his image among his base, and began cracking down on these rioters as hard as possible. Tens of thousands of federal troops were sent in to restore order in the cities. And though order was indeed restored in the short term, the harsh crackdowns only galvanized many black people into supporting the radical black power movement. Though the pacifist Martin Luther King Jr. was still seen as the leader of the civil rights movement as a whole, radical figures such as Malcolm X rapidly gained in popularity, encouraging further escalation between disenfranchised blacks and the federal government. Still, this worked to Nixon's favor, as the radicalization of the civil rights movement turned many middle-class whites away from the movement and towards the increasingly right-wing Republican Party. As election season was drawing near, Nixon hoped that this would be enough to get him over the line and onto a second term, but domestic policy alone wouldn't be enough to fix his reputation. He needed a foreign policy victory to repair the damage from Cuba, and an incident in Vietnam seemed to be the second chance he needed. Vietnam, much like Korea before it, was a powder keg ready to explode at any moment. After France decolonized the region in 1954, 
Vietnam was split into two separate parts. The Soviet-aligned Democratic Republic of Vietnam, better known as North Vietnam, and the West-aligned Republic of Vietnam, better known as South Vietnam. In 1955, the divided nation erupted into war, but it was of a much lower intensity than the Korean War, so the United States paid little attention to it. Advisors were sent, of course, but there were very few boots on the ground, until an instant in Nam Dong awakened the sleeping giant. On July 6th, 1964, the South Vietnamese military base in the Nam Dong district was assaulted by a thousand Viet Cong guerrilla fighters, hoping to overrun the installation. For two days, the defenders led by Captain Roger Donlin repelled numerous attempts by Viet Cong sappers to breach the camp, one of which led to Donlin's death. News of Donlin's sacrifice rallied Americans to support the fight against North Vietnam. In the following month, Congress passed a joint resolution, known as the Donlin Resolution, that authorized President Nixon to conduct military action in Vietnam without an official declaration of war. This also led to a rally around the flag effect, boosting Nixon's popularity as he promised to fight the communist aggressors and secure Vietnam for the West. Though the Nam Dong incident happened too late to help Nixon in the primary, he hoped the war in Vietnam would be enough to win in November. The 1964 Republican primary was, in many ways, a mirror of the 1960 Democratic primary, a bloodbath between the party's liberal and conservative wings that threatened to tear the party asunder. Nixon had fallen in with the conservatives in his party, hoping to maintain what little anti-communist credibility he had left, while New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller headed the liberal wing. The debates were vicious, with Rockefeller denouncing Nixon's foreign policy blunders and backsliding on civil rights. Nixon, in turn, denounced Rockefeller as a communist sympathizer for his support of the civil rights movement. Against all odds, the voters ever so narrowly chose Nixon over Rockefeller. And just like Johnson did four years earlier, Rockefeller announced that he would run his own ticket in the general election. Meanwhile, the Democratic Party managed to mend their break from four years earlier, and the independent Democrats were subsumed into the Democratic Party. The Democratic primary was once again a battle between the liberal and conservative wings, with Lyndon B. Johnson again leading the liberal wing, and Alabama Governor George Wallace leading the conservative wing. But this time, there was no contest. Wallace was extremely unpopular outside the South for his hardline pro-segregation views, and Johnson won the nomination handily. The general election campaign was no less intense, with Nixon desperately trying to rally support from the Republican voter base despite his unpopularity while Johnson and Rockefeller split the liberal vote. Notably, one such Nixon campaigner was the former president of the Screen Actors Guild, Ronald Reagan, who will become very important to this story in the future. On November 3rd, the voters went to the polls, and while everyone waited with bated breath to see who would come out on top, tragedy once again struck the nation. At 3.48 p.m. at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles, California, President Nixon was walking to his suite while being heckled by a fellow guest, when suddenly multiple shots were fired at the president. The culprit was tackled to the ground by Secret Service agents, and Nixon was rushed to a nearby hospital, where he passed away 50 minutes later. The gunman was revealed to be Lee Harvey Oswald, a communist who, according to his own testimony, wanted to destabilize the country to pave the way for a communist revolution. This assassination threw the entire country into chaos, and the election night results did little to assuage the public's fears. When the votes were finished counting, it was clear that no candidate came even close to the necessary 270 electoral votes. Johnson won a plurality of the electoral votes at 197, along with a plurality of the popular vote. Rockefeller's independent ticket came second, with 183 electoral votes. Ultimately, the late Nixon's ticket came last, with 158 electoral votes. Not only did no candidate come close to the total needed for an outright victory, but Nixon's assassination on election night cast doubt on the entire process. With the Democrats not in control of the House, and the Republicans split on whether to support Nelson Rockefeller or Jim Rhodes, it would seem the United States government was on the verge of total anarchy. Ultimately, it would take until 1965 for the question of succession to be settled. Rockefeller knew he was never going to be able to win over the Republican House due to him abandoning the party and running an independent ticket. Still, he understood his position made him the kingmaker. Johnson and Rhodes both attempted to court Rockefeller, offering increased concessions in exchange for his support. 
Ultimately, in what would be known as the Treaty of Pennsylvania Avenue, Rockefeller chose to support Rhodes on the condition that he support further civil rights legislation and increase national defense spending. Supporters of Johnson were outraged, denouncing the agreement as a corrupt bargain, but there was nothing they could do to prevent Rhodes' confirmation. However, the Democrats did control the Senate, and they elected Johnson's running mate, Hubert Humphrey, as vice president. With the government at last reaching some semblance of normalcy, Rhodes was left in an unenviable position. The United States had only seen loss after loss in the Cold War, and it was up to him to turn things around and reassert American supremacy on the world stage. Thank you so much for watching! I wanted to have this video out in February, but I didn't quite get the script done in time, but still, I hope you enjoyed this video. I put a lot of work into it, and I hope to have the next episode out sometime in April. Until then, if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, hit the sub button, it really does help me out a lot, and I will see you next time.